There's no. That's impossible. No, it 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 is. You think? Impossible. You think there's somebody that ri- has run out of words? They just yeah, stopped talking. Yeah, people. They did make like a, the elderly. Definitely people who lose their ability to speak. Well, yeah, that's true. And they did make that Eddie Murphy movie called 100 Words. You probably didn't see it because Mm-mm. no one did. But uh, presumably he could just say 100 words and uh-huh. then he, uh, I guess, died or they stopped filming at least. What? Yeah. Judging by how Eddie Murphy speaks, I would guess it was probably like a four to five minute movie because that guy can talk real fast, yeah, real yeah, quick. Yeah, 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 I'm thinking that. Donkey from Shrek. I'm always thinking Donkey from Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> poem that I wrote the day after the riots in Charlottesville happened. Kind of captured the mood of how I was feeling. Might have captured the mood of how others felt as well. When your policy is power only, your words no longer matter. Void of meaning, merely echoes of your mania. And after everything you said and tweeted throughout your torturous campaign, We don't let you off the hook when you owe so weakly claim that what happened in our states today is, quote, so sad. Of course it's sad, we know that. On that, at least we agree. But the problem, I'm afraid, is that you simply cannot see, nor do you care, that through your threats and through your words, you have allowed, no, you've encouraged acts of violence, hatred. Worse, it's not only your words, but also what you refuse to say. No disavowal, not one vowel, against those predators that prey on everybody in this nation who is black, a Jew, or gay, who is from Mexico or Syria, or has a non-Christian way to pray. You say this problem's not Donald Trump? Well, allow me to respond, to show you how the vile bile you spew destroys our common bonds. You're complicit in demeaning women when you bellow, lock her up, and when shirts proclaiming Trump that bitch show up, then you clam up. It's so strange that you're so quick to brag that women let you feel them up, yet when it comes to women's rights, you just like to repeal them up. It's implicit in your mockery of a reporter just doing his job, that you think of disabilities as fodder from your comedy, well it's a lock that he's more of a man than you and your whole lot could be. When you're explicit and harangue immigrants as drug lords and as rapists who are bringing crime and poverty, you make them sound like Satanists, you fail to see that given time and liberty, these people are what helps make America great. And you don't need to dial back the clock to some imagined time in the past when we can more openly discriminate. You want immigrants with advanced degrees who already speak great English? I guess you're lucky you're already here because you've got no pedigree and your voice makes me quite squeamish as I listen to you garble our language in strange ways that, quite frankly, frequently cannot be distinguished as English. When you shout, throw them out, to people at your rallies, when we see your supporters invoking your name as they beat up a homeless man in an alley, when you paint the world in black and white where everyone who's not just like you is the other, you're condoning violence towards people who are truly our sisters and our brothers. So you don't get to sit back and say, so sad, about the hatred on many sides. It's time for you to take a stance and finally deride the people spouting hatred in your name. So take a glance inward, if you can do that, and give the word that this is not acceptable. Except, of course, you won't, because you don't care. As long as they support you, you will always stare the other way. And sure, you'll offer empty platitudes and say we should unite, but your attitude's unchanged because you'll never pick a fight with anybody who adores you and who hallows your great name. You're so shallow you cannot deplore these people. What a tragic shame. And what a mystery that we are led by one so ignorant of history and one so devoid of love, one with not a single shred of genuine care for this nation or even of a single person in it who's not there to stroke his ego. And so we go spinning off in cycles of violence while the man at the podium tweets nonsense in silence. You are a terrible president and an even worse human being. It would be nice if just once, even though you don't believe it, you could stand up for something that truly matters. 
you have no problem publicly slamming Mitch McConnell, or much more bafflingly laughing at Rosie O'Donnell. Yet when people threaten what our nation stands for, you don't show rancor just because they trumpet the name Donald Trump. It's to use the word so eloquently stated by you, so sad. But if I know this great nation, and it won't wait by fear guidance, we're packed with strong people with passion and who are filled with pride, and we won't stand by twiddling our thumbs and sitting glumly waiting for your actions that we know will never come. America is already great. No thanks to you, you bum. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. This All is the Millennials. I'm oh, Pat. <laughs> I'm Ruby. And we have a very special guest today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Micah Margulies. Thank you, Pat, and thank you, Ruby, for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank We're you for excited. being on the show. We're excited to have that you. That was a wonderful poem. Goodness gracious, you captured my thoughts and feelings. That's kind of the hope, you know. Uh, I, I, I I like in a way I didn't know. In a way I didn't know. Like you gave it to me, and delivery was great. Thank you. Was gracious. Uh, I I write a lot of poems. Um, and uh, when I woke up the the morning after Charlotte's, after everything that happened in Charlottesville, the night before, I was just thinking to myself, I'm I'm really, really angry about just how absurd all of this is. And usually with a poem, I I kind of just have one good opening line and if i can get the first the first line down or the first even just a good phrase from there the rest <laughs> kind of evolves and so that one came out and then that was one where after i wrote it i said i'm going to share this one on facebook this seems like one that i think people would like yo I'm yes glad you did do you want to drop that on a beat you know dude I, for real <laughs> uh, i i haven't uh, i haven't dropped any poems on beats before uh since maybe our freestyling days back in college oh man um but uh you know, if you want to put a beat behind it, you can put down whatever you want. Yeah, that'd be Give fantastic. that extra oomph. Mike and I went to college together at KU. Yeah. Ruby also went to KU. She happened to go before I did. Yes, and after. <laughs> and what else do you do? So I'm a teacher. What else do I do? You mean they don't pay me uh, large amounts of money to <laughs> occasionally post poems on Facebook? No, I, I teach middle and high school English and Algebra 1, and I'm also the theater director at a very small school called Hyman Brand Hebrew Academy, the only Jewish day school in the state of Kansas. Really? Really. And you uh, you told me that you, uh, speaking of poems, you told me that you do the spoken word poetry slam club? Yeah, so a teacher... At school? Yeah, so uh, uh, a colleague of mine and I, we started a club that we call Ram Slam, our school is called Hyman Brand Hebrew Academy, or HBHA for short, and our mascot is the Rams, so we're the Ram Slam poetry team. Uh, and every year, we've been doing it, I think, since either my first or second year there, and I'm this is my fifth year there now, so we've been doing it for at least four or five years. And every year, we, uh, we go to this slam poetry competition with other a handful of other schools in the area at the end of the year, and it's just an awesome time where students get together and they read poems and it's judged in a sense that there's a winner but really it's just about kind of the camaraderie of students sharing their ideas there are some mind-bogglingly awesome poems there i i can imagine i can imagine because i'm sure like what 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 topics do is that whatever it's like, it's anything there there's no uh restrictions they encourage at the competition they say um, you know, don't really lace it with a ton of profanity because it's like yeah. a school event okay. for many schools, but they don't actually censor anything anyone says. So usually they're pretty political. So I'm definitely expecting some, uh, some Trumpy poems, uh, when, uh, <laughs> when March rolls around, unless, you know, things can happen. He might be off the table, gone, who knows, but yeah. you never know. Um, but I would definitely be expecting ones. There's a lot about identity, race, gender, whatever people want to write about and it's really cool what we do during the year is just on fridays during lunch anyone who wants to who's part of the club there's usually about seven or eight students each year they uh we meet in my room during lunch and people just share whatever they've been writing whatever they're working on and it's just a really i think an awesome way for students to express themselves in ways that they don't really normally get to in the average classroom setting and we have a rule in the club, which anything that anyone shares in a poem doesn't really go outside of the classroom. Oh, 
that where we're doing it because people sometimes like to share really personal things and it's awesome that it's kind of this unique space we create with students from ninth through 12th grade who feel comfortable expressing themselves and sharing ideas in poetry. It's really one of my favorite things that I do is being a part of that club. Oh my gosh, that sounds so awesome. So how long have you been doing it? Have you seen people grow through this? Like, have you had people for years yeah, going so, through it and you've noticed their growth through poetry? That's amazing. Yeah, so there's a lot of people, there are some people who come to the club who I'm like, I would absolutely 100% expect you to be into poetry, you love English, you, you love re reading, you love writing, I've had you in English class before, this is not a surprise. And there's some people who are really quiet and really reserved and... They might not even, when they first start coming to the club, really want to share anything. But then sometimes by the end of the year, or like you said, within a couple years, they love sharing and they take kind of the leadership role. So it's a really laid back club. I mean, I'm the, the leader of it kind of by default by being the teacher there, but it's really, there's nothing that I have to do to prepare. It's just, we show up and people share whatever poems they have. And, and I like them to know that I'm a part of it too. So I'll share whatever stuff that I'm working on. Um, I try to write a poem at least every t two or three weeks to be able to share with them. Sometimes I'll really get on a roll and get like many in a week. And I'm like, hey guys, look at this. <laughs> uh, but uh, sometimes, you know, with writing, sometimes three weeks, a month goes by and you're like, I really got nothing. It's really, I feel yeah. like I've run out of things to say. But then you get back in the zone and so. Well, yeah, shit starts happening and you're like, I have feelings about this. Yeah, Donald yeah. Trump helps. He's like a poetry generating machine. Right. Because uh, yeah. uh, there's an inverse relationship between his wizardry with words and uh, the words from other people that he generates. So kind of an interesting dichotomy there going on, I think. So. Speaking of Trumpy poems, <laughs> I have... Uh, <laughs> Is that the official <laughs> adjective? Is it Trumpy? Trumpish? Trump-esque. You, Trump you, Trump you used it, and you're the English teacher. That's so true. I'll follow your lead on that one. <laughs> That's fair. And, uh, so this actually comes ac across a deeper question in, in my mind, uh, given the variety of your influence as an English teacher at a Jewish academy. <clears throat> um, and touching on an article that you sent me, the us, I should say, um, regarding the white politics, white identity politics, the New York Times article. Um, how, in your opinion, do you view, at, from the Jewish community, the white identity politics uh, that you that are described in that article, for instance? And you can maybe elaborate uh, on the article if you feel it necessary to clarify. Um, obviously, we're minority, Ruby and I are minorities, so like... It's not that, oh, I, I guess I'm inclined to include you in that ethnicity group. That, yeah. And I, obviously I know that there's like different sides politically, but I feel like you guys, uh, or the Jewish community, I should say, would have like a different perspective because they uh, happen to be included in the group, quote unquote, groups of people that are hated by those quote unquote hate groups. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm curious, uh, that dynamic, and uh, even sp more specifically, uh, how the kids that you're saying that write Trumpy poems, how they, uh, their perspective on it and how you guys interact with that? I think that's an, a great question. And it's kind of, so from my perspective, I can't really speak for everyone, but for me, I definitely consider myself white. I mean, that's, that's no question. So, you know, any racial survey, I'm, I'm going to put that I'm a white person and I don't really think of myself 98% of the time as a minority person in the United States because my Jewish identity, while it's central to who I am and is a key component in like everything I do and my job and where I went to school and mm -hmm. most of my friends are Jewish, um, because I, I rarely, very rarely in my life have felt persecuted as a Jewish person. And then when things happen, which kind of raises that idea, it sometimes hits me and other people in our community like, whoa, we don't, we don't really think of ourselves in this way of, of like, but there are people out there who hate us just because we're Jewish, just like there's people who hate people because they're black or Hispanic or whatever other minority. Yeah. Um, you guys probably know there was uh, a shooting at the Jewish Community Center a couple years ago. Yeah. 
uh, when we weren't, I was teaching there at the time. So my school, HBHA, is attached to the same building as the Jewish Community Center. So they're like separate institutions, but housed within the same building. Mm -hmm. So it was right where I work. And we weren't there because it was spring break. So there were no students there. But when we got back to school, it was obviously something that we discussed. Um, and really the general reaction, I would say, from most students and from myself too, was people just being shocked to a large degree because we never really think of ourselves like, I, I can't believe there are people out there who hate us just for being Jewish. That seems to most people, I think, my age and certainly students younger than I am, it just seems like something so in the past. Yeah. Like anti-Semitism seems so much like something from the 40s and not something we think about. And luckily in America, it's it's certainly not a group that you know sees a ton of persecution, but knowing that it is out there, it does certainly raise my awareness and hopefully other people's awareness that, you know, this is still an issue that needs to be discussed and thought about. And, you know, we need to continue always doing things to combat bigotry in all forms. So, okay. So do you, and, uh, when, and when you're discussing it with your kids or your students, uh, do you guys create a differentiation between how you guys view it within Judaism or just, uh, view in what, the community community in general how what the reaction to Trump uh, the nationalist uh, white identity politics or uh, or any identity politics for that matter well again first I'll speak for me before I talk about how I think maybe our school addresses it for me mm -hmm. um, I think it kind of puts I feel like I'm in a somewhat unique position in that like being white I feel like I'm in the dominant majority culture you know the people who um, you know, are not oppressed. People who have power in society, while at the same time, being Jewish, it also gives you kind of an alternative minority perspective thinking, oh, well, at the same time, I have, uh, you know, I'm part of the white dominant cultural group. I'm also part of this subgroup. And if I wanted to, I could just tie that identity. You know, I could just be, oh, not Jewish. I could go to um, any, I could go to a white supremacist rally if I wanted to and fit right in and no one would know. Oh, true. Um, that, right. And so it kind of, you kind of have to force yourself to, to say, I, this is someone, I, something I'm proud of. This is a part of my identity that I embrace and want to show off because unlike a, a more obvious, identity like someone's skin color that there's no there's no getting around that there's no hiding what you look like but your religion you could change that or hide it in some way if you want and so for me I think of it as I have a responsibility as a, to stand up and say this is absolutely something that is completely intolerable bigotry in any way and even if you're not persecuting me as a as a Jewish person or as a as a white person you know it, it could happen at any time as we've seen, in terms of how our school handles it, um, you know, we, I would say we are a very socially active minded group. Every year we take part in some sort of social justice project as an entire high school community. Our school is a K through 12 day school. What's an example of that? What did you do? What was the last one you did? So here are the ones that we've done since I've been there. We have done something to raise awareness of um, medical access that people have access to on the Missouri side. Our school's on the Kansas side, but we went door to door in uh, Missouri and basically just canvassed there and talked to people about healthcare access that they might have access to that they might not be aware of. We did a thing where we tried getting people to get out and vote during midterm elections. Great. And we did one about two years ago, we did one about universal preschool education and there was a bill being discussed uh in missouri about that and so we kind of raised awareness regarding that and last year's was really interesting was they it was about um trying to get a a, a police review board a board to review complaints against the police department in missouri in kansas oh, okay so it was really cool and so our school, I was not a part of this, but there were several students who met with 
police officers and met with the police department and talked about getting some sort of over oversight board and committee to be able to... Who would be members of that? Members of the community or the police or both? Members of the community. Okay. Um, a community board, because as it is now, I believe, I don't want to misspeak, but I, I think right now, basically, if someone complains to the police department about being mistreated at a traffic stop or whatever it is, it's overseen internally within the police force. So oh, there's no okay. sort of outside accountability. And so this would be to try to kind of raise that, um, to change that system so that there is an outside accountability. Yeah. So our school is very much, uh, a big part of what we do is taking things outside the school boundary. We're a really small school. The high school itself is fewer than 50 people. And the entire school, I know, you couldn't see that, but Pat made a very surprised look. <laughs> and K through 12, we're probably um, around... 240 I think um it fluctuates year to year and so but we we do try to make a large impact in the community there's a a Hebrew phrase which is tikkun olam which roughly translates to repairing the world and that is a very central aspect of Jewish identity and it's something that we take really seriously at our school and it's something I take great pride in oh I wanted to ask is your school Obviously, it's a Jewish academy mm-hmm. center. Is it, like, religious? Like, I went to Catholic school, for instance, and I had to actually go to Mass, like, two mm-hmm. times a week. And, like, in the middle of the day, we would have, go to a Mass and do the whole thing. That was crazy. So it's it's a unique school with uh, for a Jewish school because there's a lot of different denominations of Judaism. The three biggest ones in America are Orthodox Judaism, Conservative, and Reform Judaism. And there's a lot of Orthodox Jewish day schools in larger Jewish communities, like New York, L.A., Chicago. Uh, And there's conservative Jewish day schools and maybe some reform ones. There's very few that are non-denominational, which is what our school is, meaning Jews. Basically, it's the Jewish day school for any Jewish child in the area who Mm -hmm. wants a Jewish education. So um, how do you prove your Judaism? Yeah. It's it's anyone who would it's not there's no oh, background you, oh, check okay, it's not yeah, like yeah, you can, it's not like you go to a, swear to me <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's not that it's if if you're a Jewish person if your family identifies as, as Jewish and you identify as Jewish and you want to go you can go that is an interesting question because interesting. Jewish law is kind of complex and according to traditional Jewish law a person's considered Jewish if their mother is Jewish. But other denominations of Judaism might consider it if one parent is Jewish, regardless of whether it's the mother or the father. Mm-hmm. So, but there's no, there's no test. If you, if you consider yourself Jewish and you want to go to the school, you can go there. In terms of the education, it's a dual education school. So obviously we cover very thoroughly core subjects, English, math, social studies, science. But every student also uh, attends prayers in the morning. You do have a choice of different services you can attend, whatever you want. And every student learns Hebrew, and every student takes a Jewish studies course. And those Jewish studies courses vary frequently. Mm-hmm. It's a Torah study course. It might be a Jewish history course. And But those two things, Hebrew and Jewish studies, are something you take every year, K through 12, if you're a student there. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. You'll be very knowledgeable about your religion. Yeah, I mean, the hope is yeah. that, you know, what's interesting is... It's an awesome mix because it's not just an Orthodox Jewish school or a conservative school or a reform school. So you get students mixing who come from a lot of different Jewish backgrounds. And so I think it leads to students who are way more open-minded and considerate of other people's beliefs and ideas. Even though it's still all within the branch of Judaism, there's wildly different ideas and philosophies that people come from. Yeah, it would and, be like if you went to a, a school that was like Catholic. And Baptist, uh, Baptist and Methodist, exactly. And- which would be awesome. Yep. Not really. I mean, I'm non-religious entirely. I so. would like to not go to religious. I at least attribute my atheism to the fact that I was required to go to mass <laughs> in the middle of the school day. You so in, in spite the fourth in spite. grade. <laughs> nah, I mean that's maybe where it started, but that's not how I ended up there. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't think you're the only person who uh, became an atheist because God was foisted upon him against his will. You know, you know it I wasn't. It was. It was kind of that that caused me to start questioning. Stay start woke. questioning, and then it was. Uh, I guess it. I would be the. It would have been the death of my mom that was like really yeah, the I point when I was like, oh, God doesn't exist. Like that doesn't make any sense that this would happen yeah, to like, us, why? to our family. And then, and then, 
I went on a pursuit in spite of like the knowledge to like prove it wrong. I was like, well, let's look at the history of this. Let's look at how man has influenced religion. Let's look at these religious wars, you know, throughout history, the Crusades and everything else that has like forced religion upon men in different areas of the world. Uh, that kind of led me to that belief. Now, I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. I think to each their you're own. You're not a door-to-door -door atheist? Yeah, and, exactly. And have you considered letting not God into your life? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it started somewhere. But even, even like way before my mom died, I remember going to church and remember not, even as a kid, I was just very skeptical. I was like, none of this makes any sense. I was a very skeptical child. Uh, and when it came to think came to things that I didn't wasn't able to see I was su super interested in science from as early as I can remember for, in biology and science and dinosaurs and astronomy from I remember from like kindergarten and first grade and like even at that young age I couldn't reconcile those two things and I remember going to church like as a small child and like just go, it, like it was just going through the motions like everything was just going through the motions I and I never really way. felt anything real I felt the same way. I just, it felt like such a routine. I, that I didn't really, I don't know. The analogy would be like, uh, like pretending to be straight your whole life. That's what it felt like to me is like, I, if I went through my whole life and just played along and like just acted mass, like that, yeah, and did this, did that. I would be like so unhappy. I hear you on that. Yeah, I kind of swerved that conversation no, into I, my <laughs> personal philosophy. I mean, that's I, I I think it's important for, you know, at the very least, comparison, I, though. it is a good comparison. Yeah. And I think I'm hearing you say that is is awesome because you know I think the worst thing is people who, whatever you choose to believe, definitely at least go through the critical thinking process of evaluating it for yourself. Yeah, I right. Agree. Uh, I remember it's Richard Dawkins. You know, Richard Dawkins, the, uh, so he, I think it's in The God Delusion, he says something about um, how it always upsets him when parents say, this is my Jewish child, or this is my Catholic child, and he's like, no, in his fancy British accent, he's like, no, um, he says, no, this is, I am Catholic, and I'm, and this is my child, and when he grows up, he will say what he is, right, because, mm. I mean, I, that's not to say you shouldn't, you know, if, if you're, you know, you can raise your child in a Jewish way, a Christian way, however you want to raise them. But I think his larger point is a valid one that ultimately a person should go through the thinking process themselves and determine what it is that matters to them. It is and weird what it is to state to that you have a whatever child. Like, it'd be more, I think, normal to say we are a Jewish family or yeah. whatever. You know, because then you're kind of dictating how you're choosing to raise your family, but ultimately you know, that child will eventually go on to have their own family and have their own opinions. But to uh, introduce your child in that way is a little bit weird. Richard Jockins, I like him a little bit, but I think he's very combative. And oh, I, he's super combative. And, and he'll have like, no respect for your beliefs. Yeah, and I just, uh, I don't appreciate that. I used to think like that. When I was young and angry, and I, I, I was very combative too. And then I got to a point where it's like, well, it defeats the purpose because... It expels so much energy. As soon as it expels a lot of energy, oh, okay. but then just taking that tone, I study a little bit of nonviolent communications where you are... Pat always suggests that. The <laughs> ultimate... <laughs> Studying nonviolent communications? Yeah, yeah because you... Learn. And you say, Pat! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the, the main philosophy of it is that you identify what your needs are and the other party's needs are, and then you build a foundation off of that as opposed mm -hmm. to... Uh, like uh, angrily accusing people of doing things to you or uh, or just presenting what you perceive as people acting against you or things like that. What you, you demonstrate, that you communicate, uh, this is how I perceive it. This is how I feel. This is what's going on. And this is the things I need for it to change. And then they have the opportunity to react to that and say, well, that's and not what I'm. Their own. But it's not. You can't use accusatory uh, language and uh, and things like that. Wait a minute. Are you saying that you think that listening to other people and hearing <laughs> what they're saying can lead to genuine conflict resolution? Yeah. <laughs> My mind is blown. <laughs> I've never heard such a radical thought. Never we just had a breakthrough. Has it, never I've, has it been. Successful. Have you ever considered running for president? September sixth, twenty seventeen. <laughs> 
I like how you check Pat the time. <laughs> For the, to see, is, is the year lurking here? We're going to go down in the history books. Uh, That's yeah, the plan. Michael will be teaching about me in a class someday uh, when he's the near wise, retirement. Pat the Wise was the one who said, listen. And, you know, you might learn something from someone else. But, yeah, this is not a big era of listening. It's a big era of bluster. The issue, really is. in my opinion, big though, bluster. is when you're forced big to listen bluster. to people who are very obviously and just wrong about and ignorant about the things that they believe are true to be true and they espouse the, so president. i'm getting, I'm, I'm bringing it back <laughs> i'm bringing it back to your poem where uh you talked about i forget the exact line but uh i love hearing my work quoted back to me so you said sarcasm it was a line preceding the word mystery one so ignorant of history that one so ignorant of history, and it's not just one; it's many people very ignorant of history, and it just kills me. Uh, you see, it's unfortunate because of the relationship that I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg. Like the media present what the people wanted, or did they create what did the we're... media create what the what the audience? And was so for? I can't just blatantly come out and say it's the media's fault. It's the media's fault. Like we all have to take individual responsibility. But it just become has become so combative about you know who's right and who's wrong, and it's like well one side is obviously wrong, you know, and the other side have to to is them. not so obviously but also wrong, but they're wrong in their approach and how they interact with it. In my opinion, uh, the left and pro- progressives, whatever you want to call them, yeah. our side, my side, whatever. And so, but my point is that the people who like are representing like these hate groups and the people who are supporting Trump. I'm not trying to combine them all into one group. Although the one group is the people who support Trump and it's made up of a bunch of factions and like 75% of those people, roughly uneducated guests are people who have really a misunderstanding of how history went. Yeah. Uh, just really ignorant about things such as race relations in our Mm -hmm. country, the history of it, uh, the history of even capitalism in general in our country and even Western philosophy in general in, in terms of that and religion. Like in so many different aspects of history, American history specifically, people are super duper ignorant. And they have this notion of what America is supposed to be in their mind and they feel like that's what they're fighting tooth and nail over. And that's just wrong. It's completely wrong. It's based off of... In my opinion. Yeah, it's based off of, I don't know, nothing or fed information. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it, it has to do with... In my opinion, it starts like parents passing down stories of like... I was talking about specifically in the South. Parents passing down stories of like their great parent, grandparents or whatever that fought in the war and how they were bad at the civil war and how they're badass and they're heroes and this is our heritage and, and these things and these people they don't see they didn't see the racism of that day or, and the slavery and those issues they're of that day what their family is presenting and that's what they believe identity. what they're fighting for and it's they don't understand how it's intrinsically tied together mm-hmm. because they don't see slavery today you know? And most people don't really seek out outside information, right? Most people. Right. And so this is something that I've been talking with a lot of people about since the election. And I really think this, I don't think that what I'm going to say is some revolutionary idea that other people haven't thought of. But I really think the only time when, the only era when Donald Trump could have been elected is is now. And the reason why is because there's no kind of shared reality. I wrote a poem about this too. Um, but there, there's no... There's no real shared objective reality that people are experiencing together because if you're a liberal person, I'm a very liberal person, I, most of my new sources that I read are going to be very liberal, right? I, unless I seek it out, right? Facebook has seen what I click on. So they're feeding me articles from the New York Times. They're feeding right. me articles, you know, from Slate. They're feeding me articles from new sources that I seek out and that I look at. Um, if you're a conservative person, it's going to reinforce that there was some article that i read about some guy who just as an experiment to see how facebook's algorithm worked he started just liking very only right-wing pages so right-wing political figures and news sources and it's and then he looked at how it transformed what things they would advertise to him 
and it was obviously got more and more conservative it's just constantly reinforcing your own beliefs so unless you actively take a, a way of saying hold on i'm going to read what some other source says that is not necessarily going to just constantly reconfirm my own beliefs you're just going to be perpetually within this same cycle and that's why people are like i can't believe that other people believe this because right. everything that i read is saying this and that's on both sides um and of course me oh, yeah. you know I'm going to say what someone on the right is going to say. I'm going to say, yes, but what I'm reading is right. <laughs> right. So uh, it's correct. Why aren't they, why don't they realize that? Someone that's on the, all you're seeing. Exactly. So getting back to how I think this fed into to, to Trump being elected, if you go back 40, 50 years ago, or even not that recently, certainly before the internet, and um, most people were getting their news from obviously not the same source, but there was a much more limited number of sources, you know, and maybe it was CBS news, maybe it was the New York times. And so there was at least some sort of shared communal experience of what people were getting. Now I could read the news voraciously and someone else could read the news voraciously. And we might not read any things that are the same right. and they might be completely politically different. And so it leads to kind of this, I feel this fracture where, you know, if, if there was more shared news sources and more, as I would say it, people like sharing actual reality together and reading things that were not wildly biased, maybe on other sides, I don't think his election would have happened. That's just kind of my personal yeah. thought on it, that the that social media kind of enabled his election to happen is kind of my take on the situation. Yeah, because even, well, even back then where you're alluding to about 50, 60 years ago or whatever, most of the news was on the same side. I mean, like, relative to today where, I like, we could, you couldn't even talk, in the 50s, you couldn't even talk openly about, like, being a communist without potentially getting thrown in jail. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. You know? That is... Uh, and so, like, the fact that I can, op like, the fact that I can openly say that I'm a democratic socialist and an atheist in the same sentence... Get out of here, <laughs> I'd be throwing, and I'm brown. Woo, I'd be woo, woo, in jail woo, woo. So fucking quick. We interrupt this in podcast 50s. for and Pat's have, arrest. And you have a thick beard. Have you seen that? Uh, <laughs> there's a movie with Brian Cranston, who's a, he's a Hollywood writer, I believe. It's, it's called Trumbo. Trumbo. I have not seen it, but I know. Uh, it. It's actually pretty good, yeah. and it's about it addresses that. And he's, I mean, he's a wealthy white man. Is he Jewish? In the, I can't remember. I really don't know a lot about Jewish. him. Right, he was a writer during the Cold War. Uh yeah 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 and. Um, I can't remember if his character was Jewish or not, but he was an outspoken communist, and they like bl blacklisted him. <clears throat> uh, companies that like they would sit with him and meet head executive producers of these production companies because he was like a uh, like a TV show writer or whatever, like entertainment writer, and uh, they would sit with him in meetings and was like, "We love you, we love your stuff, but we can't like publicly support you because you talk about things like s socialism and you don't like the government and you don't like." But, yeah, you know, you're anti-American and all this well, we stuff. We can't be about that because... Uh, and that was literally the climate. And it's like... So, it's it's got me like... Okay, everyone was on the same page for the longest time. But it was like a false sense almost. Because it, it's almost like North Korea like back then. Because you couldn't openly talk about... You couldn't openly uh, expose, right? Your views. Yeah. If you didn't agree with the government. Right, and so they would make you feel some certain way, or they would potentially throw you in jail. And he was a very, very like wealthy, successful writer, you know. Yeah, now you can say whatever you want. Not only can you say whatever you want, whatever but you I say, also the, the crazier, the crazier of a thing that you say, the the more you know traction you're going to get online, and the more, no matter how crazy of a thing you say, there are people lining up to follow your belief, no matter no matter what it is. Um, you know, it's it's the more outrageous you can be, the, you know, it's it's almost like a like a real like a big re like news has kind of turned into a reality show in a in a very large sense. Even yeah. I was. It is reality. <laughs> it, it is, is reality. It is reality. But it's, it's a fake reality but it's hella show. Hella twisted, like hella twisted to meet some sort of fucking agenda by who guys who uh, who has the agenda? I was listening to uh, a CNN panel. Uh, it was maybe like five or six people talking um, recently. It was just a couple days ago. And it started off for like two minutes kind of calm. And then within th three or four minutes into it, they were just shouting at each other. And at one point, the moderator was just like, 
Um, I think our viewers at home would prefer it if you guys talked one of the times so they could hear what you were saying. And I was like, actually, I think people are kind of hoping to see this. But yeah. <laughs> uh, but we can pretend like we want to hear the policy discussion. They, they Remember when the election happened, they, they came out, some uh, organization came out, and they actually counted how much time was spent discussing policy, covering policy by the major news networks. And even networks that you think of as respectable networks like CNN, they, they spent like, they were like, we spent 22 minutes covering Trump's foreign policy in eight months of political yeah. coverage. And we, it's like, okay, yeah, well. In eight months. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's complete reality TV shows. And it's, I, I don't know who to blame because it's like, I feel like people should know. It's like they don't know to take personal responsibility for it. It's like I didn't know uh, until I went to college. When I in my first couple of years of college, when I would raise my hand and, and I would say some crazy bullshit that yeah. I thought was true, and then my professors would be like, "That's absolutely wrong. You need to go and fact check that <laughs> right now. <laughs> read this, read this, read that, and then come back to me and then explain to me, what, you know, what you found, you know." And so then it was through that, that process of being like, mm-hmm. "But, but, but," you know, like bopped on my head every time I said something stupid and crazy. And forced or didn't do to, the research or didn't, yeah. or didn't like think think it through. And I was forced to go through that process of, you know, proving myself and doing the research that it's like it's really frustrating to be in a world where people aren't subject to that and they believe everything or anything that they hear and uh just say whatever they want and they believe it to be true, you know. And so much of it is, we're in a weird 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 time and humanity in general we talked about this actually on our last podcast or one of our podcasts about how our generation is in a weird place in human history where we did not experience the same uh existence as our parents did because of technology so we have a weird way like we like we can't they can't relate to us and we can't relate to them like The example that I used was like the Egyptians, like a thousand years would go by and like there would be hardly a change in technology. There'd be hardly a change in pace. Like you would learn how to live and how to exist from years and years, generations. Mm -hmm. And it's like now we have this point in society where we're like. It's happening in decades now. Yeah. That that progress is happening so Exponentially. Yeah. Exponentially. And so it's really, it's just in general hard to cope with the existence of technology, but then mm-hmm. our existence and our place in the world and in our time in human history. And I, I think with something that I sometimes think about, open this window. something that I sometimes think about with that is um, younger generations tend to be more liberal than older people. And I think that if you look back through, you know, fairly recent history, that's kind of a consistent trend you would see is that people tend to get more conservative as they get older. But what interests me is I think this, our generation, over, obviously there's tons of exceptions, but is overwhelmingly liberal. It's, it's, a, it's a more liberal generation. I think a lot of that can be attributed to social media. I think the fact that we're, um, and technology in general, the fact that we're constantly exposed to seeing atrocities happening in the country and across the world and actually not just hearing about it, not reading about it in a seeing newspaper, it, but it, seeing videos video. and seeing people on Twitter, like you're constantly Real engaging it. it. It unites the world. We hear about globalization. It's really like globalization of people's emotions and their social connectivity with people yeah. where I think people feel connected with a poor person in a different country differently than they might in generations past because they're seeing it. They're, they're really kind of not experiencing it, but Feeling it more yeah, well, that's, intimately. Well, that's a visceral reaction, too. When you see somebody suffering, you start to, like, you get empathy for that person. Normal people do. <laughs> so if you're actually seeing it on a daily basis where you're social online, mm-hmm. you know, that's obviously people are going to feel and, and and just be more aware of it. The awareness is real. And what I... Because they're living it. And what I wonder with that is as our generation gets older into our 40s and 50s, and will that liberal mentality maintain, will 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 that stay? No, I I think that even though previous generations, I think this is a a trend where people start out more liberal when they're younger and tend to get more conservative as they age, I really think that it's possible that with the increase of technology, 
I think that's going to have an impact on people's liberal attitudes. And so it will be interesting to see if, like, you know, 20, 30 years from now, people are overwhelmingly, at least socially, liberal. I don't think it has a huge impact on people's, like, fiscal views necessarily. But I, I think it'll be an interesting thing to look at down the line. I mean, I definitely think and hope, but I, I, I have a strong feeling, you know, that 20 years from now, we'll look back on an issue like gay marriage and in the same way that people look at like an interracial marriage where there might be the occasional person who's like, what? But like everyone else is like, are like, are you serious? This is actually, yeah, like, this is you would, normal. yeah, you we would see this. All it, not only is it not an one? issue. Uh, sure. I'll, I'll have one. Not only is it not an issue, but it's like, what, what were you ever upset about? Well, how could you have cared at all about this? Like, it seems so commonplace. And so, you know, maybe that's me being too optimistic about how people's views will evolve going forward. Yeah. But I definitely think it's possible because like you said, things, obviously things always change generation from one generation to the next, but technology makes things change exponentially fast. So and yeah. it's hard to cope with that. It's hard to cope with that. I used that. to believe that what oh. you were saying. Uh-oh. Almost to the <laughs> T. But then Donald Trump was elected. And then now I'm more inclined to believe in the uh, idiocracy theory. Good movie. Uh, I'm assuming you're referring to the, the movie? Yeah. Yes, go on. What is the theory? No, the, the, same the, movie? the, the medieval renaissance novel. <laughs> um, Definitely read that like Where... Uh, it ha and it has to deal with I'm not just pulling this theory out of my ass. I mean, that movie is a comedy, whatever, but there is something to the... I mean, it's based off. It's something to the effect of uh, more highly educated people have less kids. So there's an mm -hmm. uh, economic statistic there. And people who are less educated have more yeah, kids, yeah. right? Relative. And uh, so I feel like if what is happening now is allowed to continue... Where people are feel more comfortable being ignorant, and they're basically taking ownership and pride of their ignorance. And I'm not using ignorance the way that people just. <laughs> I'm using the literal definition of ignorance, not how just people mm -hmm. throw it around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then there will continue to be uh, generations of ignorance, and especially effectively, it will create like ignorance pride. You know, essentially, like they're in like thirty no, years. No, that's a big. Be, like, true. There's a huge anti-intellectualism strain in society where I mean, where people say, you know, they take pride in, like, disdaining ex. Oh, that's just what the elite experts say. It's like that's what scientists say about the climate. It's like, well, yeah, who else should we listen to about the weather and climate? Yeah, shouldn't we? I I don't know anything. Shouldn't I listen to a person whose job is? researching fossil fuels impact on the climate yeah why would i take pride sure. in being like uh, my opinion is just as valid as his uh, that, and that's my point is uh that I, and, and so maybe it's just my perception through the media which obvious which we already admitted is a flawed reality it that they present but if that is truly becoming a, uh more prevalent in society then in given that what we know about economics the economics of people uh, and population statistics, wouldn't that trend tend to increase in the long run? It's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. I guess we're going to have to encourage smart people to start reproducing. Yeah. I mean, I don't or, have any kids. I mean, you don't have any kids. Do you, do you think overpopulation is like, overpopulation is a real thing too. But people are out there having people, kids. Yeah. You know but what I'm saying? Just because Pat kids. and I aren't reproducing doesn't mean that no one is. Uh, it's just, I mean, I'm just talking about trends. And um, I'm not an expert by any means on population studies or anything like that. I did study some, a few things here and there in college. I mean, I studied uh, economics and international studies, which I have to sometimes remind people because I don't want people to think I'm like completely ignorant when I'm talking about these things. Like, what, what is Disclaimer, Pat, Pat has knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's just it's just an interesting uh, interesting thing that's going on. Um, we try not to be too political on the show. We try not but, to be, but it's so hard not to. It's so hard not to because it's, it's infuriating big, sometimes. Yeah. Like, I can talk about things that make me angry. There's a lot of things going on. You guys want another poem? Yep, let's do it. It's a, this is a much shorter one. Yeah. This is not political. This is... Um, I just thought of this. I had to scroll back it's up late on... now. You already set the tone. 
No, no, no. It's, yeah. it's not. Yeah. Yeah. This is not a political one. This was just when we were talking about social media and made me think of a poem. I wrote this sometime last year. To be honest, I have not looked at it um, in probably six, seven months. So it'll be kind of new to me too. But when you said something about social media, it made me think of this, and I think it's kind of interesting. So it's called the social network. Here it goes. Well, the life that we live in the limelight's a lie. We're in fear, yet we live like we've nothing to hide. Tucked behind likes and loves, our lives coddled and mollified. Like there's no pain, no sadness, no heartache inside. I log onto Facebook. See nothing but birthdays, surprises, celebrations, baby boys, grand vacations. No vacancies open for vagrancy, agency left by the wayside, as we're forced to put forth alive, a life that's alive inside. Let me lay it out for you simply. We live in a society surrounded by friends, and yet it's easier than ever to feel wholly alone. As we're hounded by photos that never do end, constantly bombarded by the joys that aren't our own, joy that others are feeling, while we feel our lives reeling, we wonder how is everyone doing so well? How does everyone have such wonderful stories to tell? But look deeper, look deeper. Maybe he's vacationing to wipe away his sorrows. Maybe tonight's smile belies a tragic tomorrow. Maybe their marital bliss is a sham. Maybe her boasts about joy are a scam. Maybe the constantly updated statuses happen because he's afraid that if others don't acknowledge his actions, then maybe they don't really matter. Maybe that self-confidence is just false bravado. Maybe she cried through the happy filters of Colorado. Maybe the lives that are processed and shown are no more organic than the quarter pounder with cheese that we shoved down our throat. We have thousands of friends, most unseen, some unknown, and merely a few who we ever hear on the phone, let alone see in person and let into our home. Social media is social in the sense that we are constantly on display. So we play along, but the song that we sing may not always reflect the somber note that we're sounding inside. So why must we hide our true feelings and show that everything's peachy and dandy? Sure, that beach was sandy, but you know what? I cried, damn it! That's right, I cried on my vacation. We are more than our photos. We are more than our likes. We are more than our Snapchats and our sunrising hikes. We are more than a status and more than a tweet. Hell, we have billions of particles just in our feet. So to think that it's possible to somehow discern all that I'm feeling and all that I am from a quick little snapshot is a ridiculous chan. Sure, we show what we want, but it's crucial to know that deep down below, nobody, that's right, nobody, has really gotten it all figured out. So don't think that your life is passing you by. And know that the limelight we see is just a lie. That the truth that we all bury deep down inside lies there somewhere offline where it matters. Somewhere in the complex web of our lives. Oh man, that was great. Damn. Fantastic. Well, thanks. See, that one's political. Spin, you're, you need to put these on a beat, yo. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? We can do that. <laughs> That's what Pat's for. He's oh, the producer. Let's do it. Um, yeah, I, I mean... I want to help with that co, co-producer. co Um... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just one, one that I wrote several... I, I'm trying to remember what prompted it. I, I think one day I was just, like, scrolling through Facebook. And when you scroll through Facebook, it um, it's so... Stu- you I, I think everyone has this feeling when you look through Facebook. You're like, how does everyone's life kick so much ass? Like, everyone is, yeah. like, like having the time of their lives. And they're out with their girlfriends. And they're out and they're at the party time. And it's all these amazing Vacations things are happening. And, and you're wedding. sitting there, like, I'm just working. And, like, sometimes I'm bored. And what's going on? And yeah. I'm here on Facebook scrolling through them. When literally every other person <laughs> is doing the same thing. They're scrolling. Yeah. They're going, how come everyone else's life is awesome? So I, I people do it for the gram. Like people do things specifically for social media now. It's a driving force behind people's actions. It's changing how people actually act. Yeah, it's Fuck crazy. Up. I just read an article recently about a kid. He's a basketball player who committed suicide. Uh, and I like clicked on his Twitter. Yeah. And it was like all like happy go lucky posts yeah. and stuff. Like really? up until like the day before he killed himself. Yeah, right, I mean, and because, you know, unless that is sad. some people put themselves out there, you know, and are, and are kind of use social media as like a way, some people use it that way too, to like vent their, um, you know, issues yeah. that they're having or talk openly about themselves. But, you know, 95% of people, they're putting forth what they want people to see. Yeah. And uh, there's a line I wrote in the poem that I really think about a lot, which is, Um, there's kind of this irony in place where people have hundreds or thousands of Facebook friends, but I definitely feel like people's actual web of friends is somehow like shrinking. Um, you know, and like there's, there's, it's, 
not necessarily an inverse relationship, but just because, you know, you're connected with 800 people on Facebook doesn't really mean you have 800 friends. Yeah, there's know? a study, there's a study, and I can't remember exactly where it's from, I think Joe Rogan talked about it, where the actual number of people that you can, like, even keep around in your life and on any kind of regular basis is, like, maximum 150 yeah, people. 150 people. Now, a cool thing that I'll give... Uh, that's so, including family. I mean, yeah, and that's a lot of people. I think yeah. the average Dude, person. The Mexicans is, have no room for friends. Then. Like, it's only relatives. I, I, can, I can say that because I got a lot of relatives. Um, a good thing that I'll give social media and Facebook a shout out for is it can keep people connected, um, kind of casually for long periods of time. I'll use an example, Pat. We hadn't really caught up much in, in a few years, right? right? Pat and I, we lived together at college and it's yeah. kind of a funny story I can share about how we ended up living together. I think it's funny. Yeah. I think it's great. I can share I did want to ask you uh, if you had a, a funny minute. story about me that you remember from college. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I Give me a second to think about it, but there, there, we had some great times. Anyway, so Pat and I lived together um, with a couple uh, of close friends for for a couple of years during college and then after college we graduated i graduated in 2012 you know we haven't we've only kind of kept in touch casually but uh he reached out to me on facebook after i posted one of these poems he just yeah. sent me a message and i was like hey pat great to hear from you you know 20 years ago after college we might have lost touch never spoken to each other yeah. again forever True. not because you know we had a falling out just you know, that's lives life. go that's on. Yeah. So social media, we can be friends on Facebook and there can be friends who I just kind of see what they're doing and monitor. Oh, they got married. They had a kid. And then, you know, five years later, something might happen that makes me think of them. And I reach out like, hey, what's up? And, you know, we got to hang out and cash. talk for three hours. So I will give Facebook credit for that is that it can keep you connected, give you the potential to reach out to people who you've known at any point at any time. Be like, hey, remember when we did this? Like, let's get together, catch up. Um, that happened to me today. Somebody reached out and was like, hey, remember when this was happening? And I was like, whoa. So I think that's a really that cool aspect from. of Facebook. I agree. I agree. It keeps you connected to people that you could potentially have lost. Like in other cities where it's a very global <clears throat> world now. Everybody's all over the fucking place. Especially millennials because we are the experienced generation. Everyone's trying to travel. I, so, was, I was having essentially the same conversation when we were on the road yesterday. I was coming back from Colorado. And... I was explaining, so I have problems with our society and social media and the way they so use I. technology. I don't have a problem with technology itself. It's a tool. That's mm -hmm. what I was explaining. It's just like any other tool. An axe can be used to chop down wood to build a house. And yeah. then you would never be mad at the axe, right, if no. if somebody lifted that axe and went and chopped somebody down with it, right? True, true. My problem is with the people that don't know what they're doing and that's the, that's the, the ignorance ignorance pride people like that's what i'm gonna start calling them that's my new term i coined that ignorance september 6 2017 Trade, trademark ignorance pride ignorance pride. pride that's what that was it wasn't a it was it wasn't a whatever <laughs> rally it was an ignorance rally in charlottesville in any event uh my point is that any tool can be used for good in general it's designed with I think for most things are designed with the intent of doing good, at least making people's lives easier. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if it's we just hope. not used properly, you know, if 50% of the country use axes wrong, you know, there would be a fucking problem, right? <laughs> uh, so... You're doing it wrong. You're supposed to chop down a tree, not a human being. Uh, no, no, aim over here. Yeah. <laughs> so destructive. It's so good. I mean, a great it's, image in my it's, mind right now. Yeah, and so it can go either way. It's just, uh, it's, I don't know the way to fix it, and I always say that I don't know what's the right way to fix it. The only thing so I can do yeah. is express mm -hmm. my conf uh, confusions and frustrations <clears throat> with it and talk to people who are smarter tool. than I. You know, we're doing that, Pat. We're using it as an effective tool. We have a voice. We are using it. In You're that chopping way. down that tree. We're chopping not down that, that head. Not uh, <laughs> right. Not that human skull. I want to. Um, I did want to bring it back because we got kind of political. I wanted to ask you, yeah. and I was going to ask you this the other night when we hang out, is at what point in your education, in school, or at what age, or what was the turning point when you decided that you weren't going to like do study engineering? Because uh, is that political? No, I'm bringing it away from that. Oh, oh, back. I got it. We're bringing it way back. We, we climax. We kind of climax a <laughs> we little bit. We climax, and now we are. I'm trying to bring it back. Um, 
Because I've always like been curious about that. I've thought I've always considered you a really highly intelligent person. Like I uh, believe that you uh, you graduated at sixteen from high right? school. From high school, not one of the, not from college, right? <laughs> at, uh, high school at 16 and you basically had the opportunity to do like anything that you wanted uh you were i think initially studying engineering um and could potentially be a, have gone on to be a big time engineer or architect or something like that uh I, I think you're fully capable of that um probably still are if you wanted to i mean straight up drop what you were doing and go and do that you have plenty of time People reinvent but uh so what was it what was a turning point was there a defining point or did you had you always wanted to be a teacher that's a good question you'll be surprised to hear this i do have a poem about this as well i don't need to, <laughs> to share that right now i've written a lot of poems i like writing Surprise. um no that's a great question so um I actually, I didn't mention this earlier, I went to the school that I teach at, HBHA, so I went there from kindergarten through 12th grade, so I have spent many years, this will be now I guess like my 17th year in the building, uh, that's a large percentage of my life, um, yeah. I do love it there, so I went all the way through this very small, um, intimate school, which is awesome where you know everyone, and I was very good at math and science. And English. I mean, I, I always kind of love both of them. Everything, and, probably, really. No, I mean, I, I just was good at math, and I was, and I also loved English. And um, I, I did think from a fairly young age, like from when I was in high school, I was thinking about doing teaching. Um, I even did a lot of tutoring in high school, which is kind of hard to do because, like, you're in high school, and I was just tutoring other kids in my high school. But I started do, doing tutoring back then. The reason I started doing engineering in the first place, which is when I started at KU, I was in their school of engineering. It wasn't really because of passion. They offered me a scholarship to do the school of engineering, I, I think based on like my ACT math score. And I decided I would give it a try, but it wasn't really my passion. And uh, I was in it for, I think, only the first semester I was there. And then I told my mom, I was like, um, I really want to apply to the School of Education. I think I want to teach English. And my family is a very Englishy family. My dad is a writer. He's a reporter. He's uh, right now he's the health editor for KCUR. And before he was, he did that. He uh, wrote for the Kansas City Star for maybe like 15 years, somewhere around there. So he he's a reporter. And my mom, she was an English major. Her job is she's a nurse. But she, we're, we're a very big reading family. And I've just always loved books and I always thought it would be awesome to have the opportunity to talk to students about books and use books as a springboard to talk about interesting ideas. Being an English teacher is actually a lot like the conversation that we're having right now, just using literature as a springboard for it. But a lot of these ideas we've talked about, and I can give some examples here in a second, are not far off from the conversation we've been having. And I love the idea to get people excited about reading. I've always been a really big reader and just loved literature and so really from the second semester I was in college even before college I had an idea I might go this route so you just gave it a shot you just gave engineering a shot because you got a scholarship and yeah. then you were like you know what you know, it's, it helped out my bit. student debt a little bit so for that I I'm grateful you, yeah. and I enjoy I love math and I'm really lucky because I teach at a private school um, I get I actually teach an algebra class so I teach algebra one so I teach one math class mm -hmm. amongst the five classes that I teach and I love doing that because at other schools, I probably would not get that opportunity, but I get to use my math skills and engage with it on a daily basis. And I find it super fun. So even though I would say English is definitely my passion, it's yeah. what I like doing. I like talking about ideas and reading literature. I do love math. So I'm really in a great situation where I get to use both sides of that each day, which is really fun. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean that probably adds a little spice, like a little variety. It's very if you're spicy. Doing, yeah, if you're <laughs> if you're doing the same thing all day long, it's probably or not. You know, like if you get in too much of a routine of the same subject. I know I I like I like to read about everything. I most of the time have like three or four books in rotation, mm -hmm. different subjects, like all crops. The time. Yeah, just like <laughs> different things. So, just like crops. So that's pretty talk. That's pretty awesome. I consider. I like that because I consider literature essentially the the religion of the human condition, essentially. Uh -huh. And I, I, 
That's a good one. Say Ooh, man, Pat, you are dropping all sorts of knowledge yeah. that when we're English. teaching about Pat the Wise years from now, what, what was the first thing you, oh, the nonviolent, yeah. what was that phrase That's you coined? That's not me. Nonviolent communication is not me. That's that is a philosophy. Pat. That That's is an absolute, established philosophy. That is Pat. I want to say it's Robert Marshall or Marshall Robert or some iteration of those two, names. I'm hearing Pat. So you uh, did that, you coined something I'll about I'll post the link to that. Um, but what I was saying is that uh, it's inter- you're almost you're essentially a preacher of the religion of the human condition, yeah. and it's interesting to me. Uh, it always has been in English uh, in literature courses, is that uh, everything, especially when you're young in high school and college age, and you're experiencing all these emotions, they're new, the, all these opinions, political and otherwise. Mm-hmm. And then you read this literature that's, you know, thousands of years old, a thousand years old, hundreds of years old, and you realize that you're so insignificant compared to human history. People have been experiencing these types of problems for hundreds and thousands of years, you know. Even worse things, too. And worse. And it's just like you read it and you're like, oh, my God, like, how do you even, like, put this into context into modern life? And that's what your job is to talk yeah. about that. And I, I, uh, it's such an admirable thing. So let me, give an ex- really is. let me give an example, like, with my – so I have a class that it's a combination of juniors and seniors. So a junior-senior English class. And we're getting ready to read our first book of the year, and it's going to be 1984, which I saw you had on a prominent display yes, in sure. the hallway there. Um and right, I mean, what are the things that we've been talking about and reading about in order to prepare for it? So the other day we read two different articles about um, the NSA and Edward Snowden's uh, revelations from several years ago because the book deals with a government that has total oversight over everything. We are going to watch, you know, how um, on Facebook uh, Trump revealed the Trump News Network, the, the, real, the real news, where it's just like his daughter-in-law being like, here's the real news. Is this Donald- new? Did this just happen? I did not know uh, oh, are you not aware of this? Yeah, no. no. Okay, so after... I've been okay. like MIA for the past like four days straight. It's not four days. News. It's probably like maybe a month ago this oh, happened. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you might remember right before the election, Trump said something to the effect of if, if he lost, he was planning on launching like a news network called like Trump TV. I remember that, yeah. Okay. So they've launched it, and it's basically – there's two videos of it that you can watch that are on Facebook. They're like two minutes long. One is with Eric Trump's wife, and one is with some other woman. And they're relating the news, and it's, the background is literally just a bunch of Trump-Pence signs. Oh, and they're just like – it's this woman smiling as she says in a totally serious tone. She's like, Donald, the jobs are up today, and Trump has added one and a half million jobs to the job sector since his blah, blah, blah. And, and it's, it's just like two minutes of propaganda, and – um, so uh, with, with students, I don't get like super political in the sense that I'm trying to impose my beliefs upon them, but it's still, that's, it's this relevant. is, new, this is relevant. So mm-hmm. instead of me saying, look how ridiculous this is, it's let's look at this. Let's compare this to the way that propaganda is used in 1984. Right. And so there's all these real world applications. That's just the most obviously prominent example, but I mean, you know, I'm not, the first person to say that obviously 1984 is relevant to the world today. Right. It shot to the Amazon number one bestseller list like the day after the election. Yeah. Um, right. And, uh, and you know, when Kellyanne Conway coined the term alternative facts, right, that is basically well, what be, the concept of double to think be, is to be in fair, the novel. To be 100% fair, people have started – the book has been coming back into prominence since uh, Obama <laughs> – the Obama. Well, the NSA over the, the NSA, NSA was during was Obama exposed years. from Edward Snowden and things like that. So it's not. It's not a uniquely Trumpian phenomenon. Exactly. Right. It's and uh, the interesting thing is Trumpity. Trumpity. Trumpish. Um, <laughs> Trumpite. Um, the the interesting thing is I've taught this book. Um, Every other year for the past five years. So my first year teaching is was 2013, which is when all these NSA revelations were coming out. So like that was like kind of what we focused on. Now we're going to be talking about that as well as talking about stuff with um, fake news because that's yeah. what the book also deals with um, greatly as well. And we also get to analyze it just from a purely literary literary perspective um so there's a lot going on with that uh and that's just one example but you know i I love doing that it's like we're using the book as a springboard to talk about ideas about what it means to live in the world today and And connecting it back to 
like classic literature. It's awesome. Yeah. So to me, you know, to get back to your question about engineering, I would have enjoyed that. I love math. I would not have been opposed to a job where I get to do math stuff all day long, but I would much rather engage with people and talk with them about interesting ideas. I'd, yeah. I'd much rather have conversations with people about interesting things like we're having right now than, uh, than do math. That's. But I love math. This is not to hate on math. It's not a two minutes hate on that <laughs> where we're shouting things, math, and throwing things at the at the screen. Yeah, no one's gonna be. No one here is fighting for math. Uh, Let's just no, I love clear. math. I want. I want to make that clear. Like you told math. me you were interested in maybe becoming a math teacher. Oh no! You better I hope do this doesn't do leak that. out when you apply for jobs. <laughs> Here's uh, guy. He doesn't even fight for math. I don't fight for math. I do enjoy math. Um, like was that math, math or math? Math. <laughs> math. Oh, math. Math. <laughs> 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 Mathematics. You look so alarmed. Uh, <laughs> Mathematics. No, well, I didn't. Under, I I thought you said the same thing twice, so I was a little bit confused. And then I realized what you were trying to say. The methamphetamines. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and then I got it. Um, I do want to be a teacher. I it's it's a super teacher. fun profession. Um, I enjoy it. It's it's a uh, you know there's there's a lot of work. Um, but I I love it. And again, one of the great things about the school where I'm at with it being small is we have small class sizes. So we get to have a lot of um, in-depth conversations, which is awesome. You know, most, our average class size is, is probably somewhere between like 10 to 15 kids in a class, which compared with a, pro- a public school, crazy. which is like 30 kids. Do you think you'll ever go on to teach at the college level? I'm not sure. You know, uh, right now I, I really love where I'm at. If I did something like that, it would be a ways down the line. Um, Cause I really like, engaging with high school and middle school students. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, it's possible in the future, you know, I'm not like super old. So, uh, and I love teaching. So I envision doing it for a long time. So I'll just kind of see what, where, where that leads me. But I definitely envision being, staying in school for, for quite a while in the middle and high school level for a while. All right. Well, we won't keep you for much longer. Anything we didn't cover that you wanted to? Uh, you guys want to end on a, um, a more lighthearted note that can, uh, a, a lighthearted poem that, uh, connects to school. Yeah, let's yes. do it. All right. Yes, let me, let me pull it up, uh, real fast. Keep talking for a second while I grab this. Um, by his time, by his time. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You know, he's talking, Mike is talking about how he went to, um, the engineering school for his first semester and then wanted to sw- switch after the semester. I got a scholarship to the engineering school too at KU. And you know what? I told my parents I didn't want to be an engineer. Yeah. Like I didn't. Wait. Think, so you had the exact same experience as I me. Did, not the exact same experience because I didn't take it. Like I just for me it was just not an option. I do not know why. Like it seems like so obvious that I would take money to go to school and just go. But I was like very dead set on I don't want to do that. Like I don't know why. I honestly don't know why because I do I love math and I love science and I was always really good at that. Um. So it's, it's cool to hear that you actually did take it because I've always felt so guilty about that. Like I didn't, I didn't take advantage Don't feel of, that, guilty. of that scholarship that was given to me to go to engineering school, but I didn't see you're doing the things you so love. I'm still doing the things I love It too. appears to me that the moral of the story is that you have to do what you have a passion for. Exactly. Uh, you Either can't way. be pressured into... Or misguided into doing something that you're not genuinely interested in. I can speak to that myself. I felt pressured into doing a practical degree degree because I came from a poor family and I don't have parents or uh, effectively a uh, a safety net. Mm -hmm. So I I'm a genuinely artistic person. I make music and I like to write and I enjoy literature. Uh, and all those things, but I was like, well, I need to do this practical degree in order to be successful, is what I had convinced myself at that time. All that did was take away the time that I could have been spent like, learning how to make movies, and... Because there's... But I, th- that there's being no. said, I have a very stable job, and I'm able to pay off my house and things like that soon, which will I will eventually be able to transition into this more creative lifestyle. Definitely. Yeah. So everything comes See, that's the with best of both worlds, everything. So. Yeah, it took. There's a lot of uh, very specific planning. So uh, I guess my point is, just don't do things all willy nilly and just follow your passion. Never go willy nilly. No, no willy nilly. Sometimes, 
you need to add some some spice to your life. All right, it's everybody. Okay. We're gonna go ahead and close this off with the final poem from All Michael right, Mark so, Goalies. Yeah. Uh, we'll go ahead and sign off right now. I'm Pat. I'm Ruby. And I'm Micah. So the last two poems that we've heard were uh, kind of serious. This one's a little more lighthearted. It's called The Battle. Serious name. You, sir, are the bane of my existence. And though I put up much resistance, it is useless. I cannot defeat you. I am the captain, nay, the commander, of a battalion of rapscallions of a part of the army of the good old U.S. of A. But hey... Despite our great wealth and our history, our stealth and our mystery, our wonderful weapons, you, sir, are the one indefatigable foe, I was getting a call in the middle, are the one indefatigable foe who so far as I found can't be defeated. I've entreated fellow commanders to help me wage this war against you. I've got you on the fence. You just pummel right back with new updated armor and our efforts futile. Are our efforts futile? Are we taking a wet noodle to a sword fight? We just might. But each time I think about giving up the good fight to just turn around and take flight, my foresight tells me that if I forego this sight, I can forget about ever resettling our sight right. Spark notes. You devious demon. You detestable, <laughs> disastrous devil. Leaving our minds licked and ideas derelict. You, sir, are my, nay, our, infernal foe, responsible for eternal woe, and oh, how do I loathe thee, let me count the ways. One, you rob my battalion of reason, I dare say it's treason the way you guide their thinking forum. Two, you bequeath laziness upon the shoulders of my soldiers, with pre-masticated crap that sadly reassures them. Three, your thievery knows endless bounds. You take their once-renowned creativity and wrestle it to the ground, leaving their lips stationary and sounds any sound. Four, you capsize new philosophy, upturn new ideas in favor of idiocracy. For over being thoughtful, you favor being right. My soldiers carry no guns nor daggers. Their weapons are their minds, and they stagger through the muck. Or they used to, until we found an enemy who could subdue them much too easily. They should queasily plow onward through the perils of Shakespeare, the dangers of Swift, the horrors of Poe. They should all leave them miffed, at least for a moment, but rather than shrieking and chirking in terror, my soldiers must know that what's lurking is scarier, that if they do not conquer these beasts of the word, as they age, their weapons will fade. Their mind is nothing more, till their mind is nothing more than a dull, unused blade that can't cut through an enemy any more fearsome than the honorable Dr. Seuss. So soldiers! Heed my rallying cry, and repeat after me. I will not go gently into that good night. I will put up a fight. I will slay and will smite this warlord who has lorded over us for far too long and hoarded knowledge like it was only his to wield. Smash through his shield and permeate his impenetrable membrane and remember that you are the founding member of your own brain and we don't need this foe to spoon feed us until we no longer know how to hold a spoon. We are the greatest army in the world. So let us not let that salacious Sir Sparknote act supercilious and make us look super silly. We have the weapons. We have the soldiers. We're armed with the knowledge and the books we're prepared for. Now let's go out there and win us the damn war. That's it. That's all I have for you guys. Woo! Woo! All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Check us out on uh, Facebook and YouTube and SoundCloud. Remember to ask us for advice. Hit us up, therealennials.gmail.com. We want to do an advice episode real bad. Give us something interesting. Seriously, a challenge. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys.